Okay. Hi. I've never done anything like this before. Hi. My name is... Hi. <laughs> My name is not hi. Hi, I'm Medium. Never shot a YouTube video before. Uh, I don't know how obvious that is. You know, it's kind of weird that I never see people talk about the struggle of filming an introduction, even though everyone like whines about how hard it is to film an outro, an outroduction. But it, it kind of sucks because I really don't know how to do this. Should we just get straight into it? I have a, a very charming sales pitch here. <clears throat> if you're a woman, you got problems. If you're a woman in the Middle East, you have different flavors of problems. I'm not saying that to direct the blame somewhere in particular. It's no one's fault. It's everyone's fault. It's just that recently my own identity as a <clears throat> Middle Eastern North African feminist Muslim has been weighing on me. Because on top of being a lot to get your tongue around, it's also a lot to get your head around. The way I see it, the Mina woman has two predicaments. The first is trying to navigate your identity in the context of cultural expectation, especially since tradition and gender norms are valued pillars of Mina culture. That's not a criticism, by the way. And you're watching this video in English, so it probably only gets more complicated for you when globalization and Western influence enter the discussion. And the second predicament is the question of feminism. See, it's neither accepted by the West nor by the Middle East for you to be an Arab feminist. It's hard to reconcile the term Arab with feminist because you're constantly either trying to explain how no, not all Arab people are some brand or other of stereotypical violence, aggression, and oppression, or no, the type of feminism we're campaigning for in the MENA region doesn't aim to decompose our society and trample our traditions. Basically, you're in a constant state of defensiveness. In the opening essay of It's Not About the Burqa, which is right here because I like to keep it on or near my person at all times, feminist journalist Mona El Tahawi, who I fundamentally disagree with on many points, raises a perfect example of this rock in a hard place situation that women are put in. She writes, and I quote, Muslim women are caught between a rock an Islamophobic and racist right wing that is eager to demonize Muslim men and to that end misuses our words and the ways we resist misogyny within our Muslim communities and a hard place, our Muslim communities that are eager to defend Muslim men and to that end try to silence us and shut down the ways we resist misogyny. Now Muna is specifically talking about Muslim women in this situation. But the issue is extremely similar. The Arab world is, anyway, largely influenced by religious culture. Arab women are caught between a rock, or Western society's views on Arab people, and a hard place. Arab society's views on women. So as an Arab woman, you're either a feminist with a lot of cultural trauma, or you're not a feminist, but you still recognize the misogyny that exists in Arab society. Which leads you to have a lot of cultural trauma. Now the reason this started weighing on me so much was because I felt like there had to be a way to balance feminism and Arab culture. I am a Middle Eastern and North African feminist, and I'm also someone who hates to choose. I want to be all of these things at once, no questions asked. But I knew that there were questions to be asked if I wanted to say that I was a Mina woman and a feminist, and not be self-contradictory or misinformed. To create a suitable definition for what it is to be an Arab feminist, I had to ask questions about the purpose of the women's rights movement in the MENA region. So, what is at the root of the MENA woman's struggle, and therefore, what is feminism to the MENA woman? Part 1. It that must not be named. Here's a little anecdote. So for months now, my friends and I have been trying to start up a local Girl Up Club. Now the broad aims of the Girl Up Club are to empower young women via advocacy and fundraising and also to embrace local culture and community. It's all very beautiful and very respectful. So we wanted to create a sense of community 
but we were also creating educational, well-informed workshops to try and combat cultural misconceptions about simple topics, like female hygiene, for example. So we began working on a skeleton for the way the club was going to work. Except that very early on, we began to notice a trend with our planning sessions. We would get on call for hours on end, discussing themes and social issues and how we were going to address these things in our club. But they always circled back to the same question. What was the main purpose of our club? Every issue we tried to tackle, be it double standards, sexual harassment, taboos of female hygiene, all of it seemed to stem from the same place. Yet none of us could put our fingers on the exact root of all of these problems. And it became so frustrating to try and create a template for a club that aimed to combat cultural misconceptions when that was both too vague to adopt an entire program for and yet too specific to be the root of misogyny in the MENA region. It became so stressful that at some point we began to question whether we should be starting the club at all. What was the significance of what we were doing really? If we couldn't name the big issue, did it really exist? There was my hypothesis. And just like any great scientist, in order to come to a conclusion about it, I decided it was time for some research. Part two. Yes, no, maybe. So I created a Google form titled the Mina Woman's Experience Survey. And it was aimed at women between the ages of 14 and 24 who were either from the region or who had lived here for a prolonged period of time. Now, I wasn't exactly sure what I was looking for in terms of what the root of the issue was. I didn't have two or three large factors that I was choosing between. And to be honest, it does kind of show in the wording of some of the questions. I tried. But I kind of held out hope that if I asked enough intentional questions, that some pattern would reveal itself throughout the answers. And boy, did it. The form received 108 responses. Now I know 108 in the grand scheme of things isn't a colossal number, but I would say it's not too bad for like a solo 17 year old girl. I'm pretty proud of myself. It was also a significant number when it came to revealing trends and stories. The form was anonymous and anonymity created vulnerability and introspection. Now a quick disclaimer before I present the data I'm not saying that these statistics can be applied to the entire population of MENA women, but what I am saying is that they prove the need for further research. I'm gonna get back to this point in a bit, but I wanted to say that this video isn't just for young women in the MENA region. It's for men, women, boys and girls of all different ages. It's to create a dialogue. And it's also not an attack at anyone. Not yet. So don't shoot the messenger. Without further ado, here are some of the interesting trends that came up. To the question, have you ever experienced sexual harassment? 84% or 91 people said yes outright. 12% said they hadn't, luckily. And just under 5% said they'd prefer not to say. Now I'm obviously not going to make assumptions as to why these women said they'd prefer not to say because that would be disrespectful to their choice, but Regardless of whether they have or haven't, it's pretty horrifying that 84% of the respondents said yes. Especially when you take into consideration that the way I spread this form was through my Instagram and through friends of friends. That demographic is largely going to be made up of girls between the ages of 15 and 18. Now I'd like to compare my finding with a statistic that I found. It's about the frequency of sexual harassment in the past 12 months for females between the ages of 17 to 28. And um, there's clearly a problem compared to the statistic on the sexual harassment of men in the past 12 months. What's even more harrowing is the plausible possibility that my statistic, and to that end, Arab barometers, might be teetering on a lower estimate. Because according to a study by UN Women, which was specific to Arab states, six in 10 women who are subjected to some form of sexual violence refrain from ever asking for support or protection. Basically, they'd prefer to stay silent than to speak out about their experiences. Those who eventually do, most of the time, seek that support from their parents or loved ones, not so often police or other officials. But there was a sort of theme of being ashamed in a lot of the answers that I received on the form. In particular, this one open-ended question that asked respondents how taboos and misconception shaped their childhoods. 
Some of them were extremely personal. And I'm going to refrain from using some of them because even though it's anonymous, I'm not so sure how someone might feel with their words being spoken by some solo 17 year old. Especially considering how vivid some of these experiences still seem to be to the respondents. But I've picked a few just to illustrate the general sentiment of shame and hardship that these women have had to go through. I felt trapped, suffocated, controlled, dictated, uncomfortable. I know so little of the female body and how to take care of it. Do not even feel comfortable to approach my mother with questions about it. When it came to my physical changes, I wasn't educated about anything at all. No mention of periods or hormonal changes or changes in my appearance because it wasn't something that was okay to talk about. I was indirectly taught to stay in my lane and not take too much space. I always felt watched and stared at by older men. I blamed it on myself because it was my responsibility not to look at them. One in particular sums up the consensus that these answers seem to have reached. I hated myself simply because I was a girl. And those were just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, I could go on and on. It has made me truly understand. I think I faced a lot of experiences. Fear couldn't express myself as I wanted to. But even- Okay, um, I think I've drawn several conclusions now. Side note, let's talk about internalized misogyny. On the forum, one question asked, do you believe you have internalized misogyny? To which the responses came back almost evenly split between yes, no, and maybe. Upon being asked to elaborate, responses included, I think of myself as extremely logical and practical, but I am no superhuman. No one is. No matter how much we try, we cannot escape our upbringing. Another goes, it's something that I've dealt with for so long that it doesn't affect me, or it's something in our culture that doesn't seem wrong to say or think. There's clearly a link between the silence and the lack of conversation in Arab society and the general sentiment of internalized misogyny and shame. We know that these sentiments are there and we know they're wrong, but we just don't know how to get rid of them. And we're, well, we're, we're pretty confused. And of course we are, because what else would we be when there is absolutely no dialogue and the narrative of women's rights is kind of demonized? This goes back to what we were talking about at the start, of how tradition is a pillar of Middle Eastern culture. Part of our issue is that we view the problematic aspects of our culture as completely inseparable from the sacred pillars that hold it up. We can't take them down or change them, lest we risk completely changing our culture and losing our sense of identity, all to appeal to a Western, whitewashed view of how society should work. Damn you, globalization. But that's just not true. Something we have to realize is that we don't need to be more like the West or more relatively civilized nations in order to fix the problematic aspects of our culture. We can address our shortcomings without hating ourselves. We can be pioneers of taking down the negative aspects of society. It happens all the time throughout history. Giving women rights is not taking them away from anyone else. There's a very simple, inclusive way of working towards stopping misogyny in the Middle East. We just need to address the fact that it exists. The root of why misogyny is so prevalent and blatant in the MENA region is simply because it is never addressed. As MENA women, we are taught to avoid and ignore, and at most take precautions. It's no wonder that as the girl-up team, we struggled to name the root of the problem the problem is silence. It is literally something that cannot be named. That's why it was so frustrating to try and chalk up all of these problems, taboos on female hygiene, and sexual harassment and double standards to a specific problem. It was because the problem was literally something intangible by nature. Luckily, there's a very simple remedy to silence and a lack of discussion. Part three, address. Slash summary. The way I see it, our problems can be boiled down into two simple sentences. Number one, we don't actually talk about misogyny in the Middle East. Number two, we don't know how to talk about misogyny in the Middle East. Both statements are true, and statement one leads to statement two. Okay, to elaborate on some of the points that we've already discussed, 
Because all of our problems are ignored and must not be named, we have brought up generation after generation of women who don't understand their value and their rights. Therefore, they don't see it as problematic when these rights are infringed upon. Not knowing their rights severely hinders women's advancement in society. And just like when any advancement in the history of advancements happened, a lot of research and campaigning was required. Knowledge is vital to any positive change in society. If you are a Mina woman who is trying to gain knowledge to advance in society via doing your research, you're probably not finding a lot of discourse and statistics from local resources. In comparison, you're probably finding a lot of discourse on a much more validated, much more accessible topic. Western feminism, also known as white feminism. Trust me, they've thought of everything. And boy, is that a tempting rabbit hole to go down. And reading up on white feminism is helpful to an extent. That extent is limited by the plethora of differences in culture and history, and even just language between the Middle East and the West. The roots and the causes of the current women's rights movements in the MENA region and in the West are completely different. And this becomes apparent in the sheer amount of unproductive conversations that we have about women's rights in the Middle East. Every time we bring up the need for feminism to combat a genuinely present problem in Middle Eastern culture, all anyone can think of is the associations of the word feminist, which look a little something like this. The connotations of the problems being addressed by their movements just don't ring as true in the Middle East. So the two opposing arguments that exist on women's rights in the MENA region are that we need feminism and that we do not need white feminism. They're both right, and they probably agree on much more than they disagree on in a gentle conversation. They just haven't done their research and they're really badly miscommunicating. If white feminism were to be the be-all, end-all of a conversation about MENA women's rights, then it's not that hard to see why a lot of Arab women, and just Arab people in general, have their reservations about identifying as Arab feminists. But there's one thing that we still need to remember. Just like being Arab doesn't have one meaning, the same applies to feminism. What we need in our dialogue is a revolution of the term Arab feminist as we know it. A while ago, I came across an argument that really stuck with me, and it proposed that the discussion of women's rights in terms of equality to men can be stunting because there are things that simply cannot be discussed as they relate to men. Such a comparison is futile, it's like running in circles. To reference an earlier example that we talked about, there's no point in arguing for equality when it comes to an issue like sexual harassment, because it's not about being equal to the men that oppress women or the men that face sexual harassment. It's about being free from that form of oppression altogether. A better discussion would be that that addresses liberation instead of equality. And even if you are an Arab woman who wants direct equality to men, you can't have that without first having the basis of liberation. That's part of why I'm starting this page. We need an entirely different basis for an entirely different conversation. And we don't just deserve dialogue. We owe ourselves a whole damn story. So welcome to Ota Woman. God, I feel so good to say that. <sighs> oh my God.